Good morning, and welcome to Laycock Presbyterian Church as we gather together to worship the Lord. This is the time for the announcements, and as I have every week, I urge you to send me any prayer request you have. It helps me and the congregation to know uh, where our joys, where our concerns are. And some of you have been very good about that, and it helps me when we come to the prayers of the people. Furthermore, if you know of anybody who is in particular need in any way that need may come, do call the office or call me and let me know. We will do what we can to help. Along those lines, the factory continues to need your support. There are many people out there who are struggling financially, and they always can use non-perishables and uh, any cash donations that you are willing to make. They also mentioned to me specifically this week that they're looking for shampoo, cooking spray, and oil, or cooking oil. Uh, on July 5th, a reminder, we will be regathering at 8 o'clock at Old Laycock and at 9.30 at Paradise. Uh, you'll be getting a variety of things in the mail that will detail exactly how we are regathering and all the restrictions that are still going to be in place. So look for them, but we are excited that we will be soon uh, together in place, or at least many of us will be. And finally, next Sunday, uh, just a reminder, on the 28th, we will be having communion. What, and what that means is that at home, have a piece of bread of some form, a little juice, of whatever form you so choose, and I will institute the elements here and guide you through our communion service remotely. And that concludes the announcements. Let us worship our God.
Let us pray. Dear God of grace, look down upon us. See your people as only you can. Seeing us, teach us in our need. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And now let us sing hymn 687, one of our favorite hymns, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been and help us amend what we are. Direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of holy name. Amen. No matter how many times we walk by and do not see a sister, a brother, God sees us. God loves us. God wills to open our eyes and hearts. This is why I can say to you this day in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. See with forgiving eyes. See with healing eyes. See your neighbor. Amen.
Today's anthem is actually a hymn in our hymnal in an age of twisted values, hymn number 345. I hope you follow along with the words. I will be reading some and Diane will be accompanying me uh, for some others. The lyrics speak to how if we love our country, we must work for the healing that is needed within it. And so now, this is in an age of twisted values. In an age of twisted values, we have lost the truth we need. In sophisticated language, we have justified our greed. By our struggle for possessions, we have robbed the poor and weak. Hear our cry and heal our nation. Your forgiveness, Lord, we seek. We have built discrimination on our prejudice and fear. Hatred swiftly turns to cruelty. If we hold resentments dear, communities divided by the walls of class and race. Hear our cry and heal our nation. Oh, show us, Lord, your love and grace. When our families are broken, when our homes are full of strife, when our children are bewildered, when they lose their way in life, when we fail to give the aged all the care we know they need, Hear our cry and heal our nation. Help us show more love, we plead. We who hear your words so often, choose so rarely to obey, turn us from our willful wandering. Give us truth to light our way. In the power of your Spirit, come to cleanse us, make us new. Hear our cry and heal our nation, till our nation honors you. Now let us come before the Lord with the joys and concerns that are on our hearts this morning. Let us begin with the joys. I had a wonderful conversation with Miriam Latshaw this week, who told me that she is, for the most part, confined to her room over at the Mennonite home. But she is one of about a dozen people, half a dozen people rather, eating in the dining room occasionally. She's doing well, but she says that she is concerned about the pandemic and what life will be afterwards. This is Father's Day, and I would lift up every man who has ever been a good and kind person to children. Certainly, we think of our blood relations, but we also think of others who have gone out of their way to help and walk and nurture boys and girls. I'd also lift up the hostetters. On Thursday, they celebrated their 60th anniversary, and what a joy that is. So congratulations to Milt and Barbara. Lastly, in the joy front, I, I, I'm going to lift up Sue Funk. I am grateful for all of you who have been participating as volunteers for what I have come to call the Caring Connection. Every week, 32 of you have been given randomly people to contact. And you've all been good and faithful in your work. But was I struck 
when I got an email from Sue telling me that she was going to the beach and that she was worried about whether her internet reception would be very good and she was worried that she wouldn't get her list. And so we worked it out and I got them to her, but that kind of dedication really, really is impressive and I thank you Sue and all who have been participating in our caring uh, connection. On the, skip, on the uh, concern front, rather, I learned uh, just this week that Skip Lipty was feeling uh, rather weak, and so he cut short his time at the shore to come home and to be closer to his doctor. So we pray, we'd ask that you pray for Skip. At the Presbytery office, we have a wonderful administrative assistant, uh, and her name is Chrissy. And her husband's name is Nate, and he's been under, he's had a lot of pain of late. And they eventually got him in and found through a variety of tests that he had five different, I think it was five tumors. And it took quite a while for them to diagnose those two tumors, but they have found out, sad to say, that they're a rare form of stomach cancer and it's stage four. So the treatment is beginning soon. We'd ask that you pray for Chrissy and Nate. And last, I'd mention Emily, who's going to be taking a trip down to Virginia to visit her mother. And there's a degree of anxiety about that given her mother's age, and given the pandemic, and what uh, she or her mom might be exposed to. So pray for them that she have a safe and good trip down to see her mother. Let us pray. God of joy, you gift it. You give to us so many blessings. Help us to see them. Help us not to pass them by. Help us to rejoice in friends, in family, in learning, in growing, in becoming a new creation. And may we be a grateful people this day, we especially thank you for Miriam, for all fathers, for Sue, for the hostess, and for anyone else whom we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. God of kindness, you see us in our need, and you come to heal us. It is not always in the way we want, but it is what we need. So grant us the strength to heal, even when sickness does not end. Lend us your peace. Comfort us. This day in particular, we ask that you be with Skip, with Chrissy and Nate, with Emily and Andre, and with all others whom we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. And now hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, let us sing hymn 819, Be Still My Soul.
Genesis, the 21st chapter, verses 8 through 21. And I will tell you that in my experience, and for me, this is one of the more difficult passages to grapple with in all of Scripture, at least in part. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy, and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. Now, as for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was gone. She cast the child into one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand. I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. It's a tough story. And let me give a little context. A few chapters before, Sarah, recognizing that she was well past childbearing age, decided to do something about it. And the text tells us that she gave Hagar to Abraham. Now, there are a couple things there that make you, at least me, cringe a bit. The reason she did it, in part, was so that any child that came of that union she claimed would be hers. After all, Hagar was her slave. But it also says that she gave Hagar to Abraham as a wife. So whether intentionally or not, you can argue that in some way she's elevated the status of Hagar. Well, Hagar does have a baby boy, Ishmael. And again, the story gets a little darker because she becomes very disdainful of Sarah, who cannot bear a child. But in time, as we know, the promise of God was fulfilled and Sarah had Isaac. And then it gets even darker. Sarah she sees Ishmael playing with Isaac, playing with Isaac, two boys who cannot see all the difference, 
all the distress, playing with each other. And the Hebrew word for playing actually can be translated as make one smile. Ishmael is making his little brother smile. But Sarah doesn't want Ishmael to inherit with Isaac. And she tells Abraham, get them out of there. Get that slave woman and that boy out of here. Cast them out. Abraham, well, to his credit, is distressed. He's all upset. And God tells him, now just do what Sarah asks. Because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be named for you. So in other words, the line will go through him and his wife. And so that's, you know, follow what Sarah's telling you to do. All of this is what happens, is how things go wrong when humans lose their humility and try to be in control, or think they are. Remember Micah, walk humbly with our God. And when we do not, things tend to go horribly awry. After a certain point, we see in this text, Sarah cannot see Hagar or Ishmael as having any value. This is a horror story being told. It is a horror story that is still being told. Whom do we not see? Whom are we blind to? You know, when you look around this country at all the protests that are going on, over and over again, I hear people say in so many words, it's about not being seen. It's about not having value. I'd like to tell you a story about a friend of mine, a woman, who is a person of color. She once told me that all her life, she has felt like she's living in the dark, longing for the light. She has said that always, now not sometimes, always, when she goes out from her home, wherever her home has been, she feels anxious, she feels afraid. She is unable to relax, she says, until she's given a reason not to be anxious, not to be afraid. And I do mean always. She says she feels most all alone in a sea of white faces, even at religious conferences. If she goes to a conference with a bunch of people looking for spiritual growth, spiritual formation, still, for the most part, it is a sea of white faces, and she is a stranger. She tells me that she feels like she's been living in an abusive relationship with her country all life, her whole, whole life long. And it got worse once she had a daughter who's now 16. One day, at the early days of this pandemic, she and her daughter went out wearing masks. And they were surprised. All these people, even people wearing masks, looked at them with hostility, suspicion. And they both realized it was because of the way they looked. So they went out and got what they hoped would be considered happy masks, less threatening masks, Masks with smiley faces, or a panda mouth, or something. Now what gets interesting about her story is she's not black, she's not African American, she's Asian American, Korean American to be precise. She came here at five not speaking a word of English. The other children, she, the other children would call her chink, or jap when the teachers weren't around. And they had a song, which I had never heard, but it went something like this, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees. And now, because of her and her daughter's faces, 
those Korean American faces, they are identified with the Chinese virus. Ultimately, as with Hagar, she feels that she is being ignored by simply not being seen. Now back to Hagar. Well, her water runs out, and she is so distressed, she knows what's coming. They're going to die of thirst in that hot wilderness. So she puts Ishmael, the boy, under a bush because she cannot bear to watch her son die. And she weeps because it's all done. It's all over. But it isn't. It never really is because God hears. And an angel of God says those words that run through Scripture that Jesus said so many times, do not be afraid. God has heard. Go, hold the boy's hand. And when she did, her eyes were opened and she saw a well. Ishmael means God hears. And God hears where Ishmael is, the text tells us, in all senses of the word. God hears where Ishmael is under a bush. God hears where Ishmael is, banished and cast out into a wilderness. God hears where Ishmael is, invisible, among the people he had lived. And if you look at this text I read to you, there's a curious thing. In the verses that involve Abraham and Sarah specifically, Hagar is never given a name and neither is Ishmael. They are called the slave woman and the boy. In this story, it is really ultimately only Sarah that does not see the value of Hagar and Ishmael. Abraham does, that's why he gets distressed. Isaac does, he plays with the boy. But it's only God who acts on it in a way that can lead to freedom, to being seen. In the verses with God, the woman has a name, Hagar. God does not create slavery. Humans do. And we too often are blinded to outsiders, those without a name or a place. And we banish them into other wildernesses than our own. But God, God sees the outsider. God sees Hagar and Ishmael. God, we are told, will make a nation of Ishmael too. You know, Sarah didn't want Ishmael to inherit with Isaac, but he does. He will inherit. What sustained my friend for all those years of feeling invisible in her own country? What brought her to light out of darkness was her faith. She came to believe fervently in God and Christ. And it wasn't always easy, but she believes to this day that God is with her, Emmanuel. And she is a fellow pastor. This is the truth of Scripture. God hears, God sees when we do not, and God loves. How can we do any less in this hurting time let us hear, let us see, oh, let us love. Amen. For the affirmation of faith today, I picked the, a selection from the brief statement of faith, which is really beautiful and captures a lot of the essence of what it means to be a follower of Christ in this world. And so these are a few verses from a brief statement of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. 
through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere, the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus! With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, I urge you, reach out with the peace of Christ this week to everyone you meet, stranger and friend alike. Be part of the healing of this nation and this world. And again, I want to thank you for your continued support of your church through your offerings. They are gifts of faith, gifts of faith that we so much appreciate. And now let us sing our final hymn, hymn 772, Live into Hope. Thank mm -hmm. you.